Equity means to me the best of the human condition. So I, equity is something that we should all be striving to achieve because it represents the best of us. And it means that we have to systematically address any barriers that prevent the human condition from thriving. One of the things that equity is not is the equal treatment of unequals. And uh, that has, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States found that in 1955. So often we ignore the disadvantages that certain groups of people have and then just say, we're gonna deal with everybody equally. Well, that, that does nothing but perpetuate those inequalities. So it's really important that we conduct ourselves in a way that really accounts for those disadvantages moving forward so everyone has an opportunity to succeed in the direction that they wish to travel. Mm -hmm. I would say that really it is the best evidence we have about a causal issue that undermines the ability of millions of people to live the lives they wish to have. <laughs> and when we treat people inequitably, we're also making concurrent judgments, if only implicitly and sometimes directly, that they are less worthy as a human being. There are people in the society that we don't have to worry about as long as I'm being treated equitably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it becomes a, this, this survival of the fittest kind of idea without recognizing that other persons are given different uh, starting times in the race. I think if you're a social worker and you are not looking at the equity research, and you are not acting on the equity research, then you are undermining the ability of people to live the lives mm -hmm. they wish to have. It mm -hmm. is that important. It should be a full course. And what I worry about, so often we're interested in talking about things like anti-oppressive practice without talking about the evidence of equity. And when you go out there and you, talk, you go to the laundromat and you see single moms who could only afford one uh, load to go through the dryer, and they've got three kids and they don't know where their next money is coming from the food bank, and then they get engaged with child welfare, you'll start to see why equity is so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being poor, being treated unequally is not only more exhausting, it's far more expensive to be poor because mm -hmm. you don't have the ability to go to uh, Costco, you don't have the ability to just buy things, you have to do the rent to own thing. Uh, you're having to buy a lot of things to make up for the inadequate housing that you're in. It is far more expensive to be poor. And so in the judgment of inequality, by not paying attention to it, we are in fact reinforcing this idea that uh, pe people are less human or less worthy of humane treatment than others mm -hmm. and that ought to be rejected by everyone. And that just goes back to what you said initially, Cindy, where it, 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 it holds the individual accountable as opposed to the system accountable. Right? It asks the individual to adapt to, well, how do you put dinner on the table when literally you don't have enough money through uh, income maintenance program to you know pay the rent and feed your children for 31 days in a month it's not right. like it's it requires so it you're right when you say it's exhausting it requires so much cognitive load to figure out how to get to the end of the month that when we then say oh yeah and you're not being a good parent like you're, we can't like, we can't continue to say that sentence to people that live with the symptoms of inequity. I firmly believe that we can't do that. Right, and we do it every day when we talk about neglect. And we also do it in therapeutic interventions, which really is, I think, problematic as, as social work uh, moves into this area of therapeutic interventions. If your therapeutic kind of skill set doesn't include letting people know about the additional load that they're bearing in their lives, then they're going to do what most of us do, which is they may, for example, for a First Nations kid on reserve receiving inequitable public services, it doesn't know that the federal government is making choices every day to continue that inequality. They don't know that other children in Canada don't experience that. All they know is that life is a lot harder for them. So what do they do? They start to think, I'm, I'm not worth it. 
I must be stupid. I must not be trying hard enough. And it's no wonder we see the skyrocketing rates of, of suicide. And too many people who come into First Nations community without that awareness and without that skill set actually run the danger of reinforcing those, uh, those feelings by sending these kids to therapeutic interventions without dealing with the inequalities that, they're, that are layered on top of them. You know, my mother from a very young age said to me, Barbara, you have been given things that you did not earn. That does not make you better than anyone else. It just makes you lucky. And I, I think about that sentence of so much like that. Like, I don't know what, I was in the 1970s, but she figured out privilege and she, <laughs> and she was reminding us every day, don't confuse the two, right? Don't confuse ability with, you know, what you have been given just because you've been born into this family. It's been a significant marker in my work and also the work here at the Caring Society and for First Nations writ large. The inequalities in federally funded public services on reserve are dramatic and they're cross-cutting across everything from basics like water and housing and sanitation to the services that children need to thrive like education, early childhood programs, and just places that are fun for them to enjoy life. All of those things are underfunded by the federal government, have been since Confederation. So I think as I've progressed through my career, I've seen the growing importance of focusing on equity for everyone who's in social work. It really is the closest thing we have to a solution that can address a whole myriad of disadvantages that different people face. So I really commend people to look at the work of uh, experts like Sir Michael Marmot and others and really understand equity and find a place in your practice to be able to implement it. And for me, the role of equity in my career has been one of, um, my journey has been one of awareness and a growing understanding and a commitment to always understanding how inequity impacts um, children's lives and their families. So when I first met Cindy, she uh, was talking about inequities for First Nations children and as I grew to understand the enormity of colonialism and its impact, and almost in that moment, she, I thought she was looking directly at me, but she says she wasn't, but she sort of could feel the room and she said, you know, I don't, I, I don't want you to feel guilty. I want you to do something about it. And so that was in 1999 and that, instruction, not to me, but to the room, I felt like it was to me, has been like a North Star in my work around equity. So that, that I should have a responsibility to do something about it, whatever skills I bring to the question, whatever contribution I can make, uh, has been very um, important in my career. We know from the pandemic, more black people are dying, more Native American people are dying, more Hispanics are dying, people of low income who are often in the service industries are dying. Um, what we need to understand is that this is really murder and harm by public policy. Mm -hmm. And these types of decisions that put people into these vulnerable categories are made often by governments. And they're perpetuated by a public who doesn't understand the type of devastation they wrought on their neighbors. And so it's really vital that we keep our eye on the prize here because for many of these communities, I can just say for First Nations communities, COVID is not our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Not when we're dealing with um, just this past week, We've had uh, lawful lobster fishers be experience arson, assault, um, har harassment, and in fact, I, th I would argue racketeering and blocking their lawful <laughs> lobster from going to market. We had a First Nations woman who was dying in the hospital whose last words were racist statements uh, made by nurses. That's the last thing that she heard. And we continue to see First Nations without any water in this pandemic. So in those circumstances, the pandemic 
worrying about the pandemic is really a luxury for those communities. They look outside and they see that everyone, for everyone else, that's your biggest problem. But for them, it's those everyday experiences that are entrenched in the decisions made by Ottawa to perpetuate the inequalities in public services and to not implement the treaty rights and the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, that is their most important problem. Mm -hmm. the, the pandemic has uh, uh, uncovered exactly what the system is designed to do, right? So that people are differentially impacted by the conditions imposed for the restriction of infection, uh, you, you know, shouldn't surprise anyone. And in a way, you know, the, a lot of the media is, you know, the news headline is you know, racialized communities and communities that struggle with poverty um, are differentially impacted by COVID as a, you know, as a finding or a discovery. I think that that's almost disappointing to me because, of course, <laughs> because any, any, um, any event causes that uh, disparity to be magnified. Um, yeah, I, 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 so I, I don't know. It's only important if we actually, you know, do something about it, right? It really, that's what, it, I mean, this, you know, is the, we're going to get the vaccine and then it's all going to be sort of put into the background and we're just going to be surprised the next time something like this happens and we see how inequity plays itself out with these differences in outcomes. One of the things I think is vital for social workers to do is understand what colonialism is um, and how it is, uh, it is a contemporary reality for First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples in Canada and Indigenous peoples worldwide. I want to emphasize, too, that uh, there's an overusage of the term Indigenous in uh, social work schools, where people are not looking at the distinct drivers of inequality for different populations, so for um, both within and among First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. It's very important to, to disaggregate that and look at it more closely. Otherwise, it'll mask the problem. For social workers, I think there's two real key things I would leave you with. Number one is stop codifying structural inequality and systemic racism as a personal deficit. We do this in all kinds of different ways, in structured decision-making tools, for example, or even in therapeutic interventions. Too often we don't ask ourselves the question of what does this person actually have control over to change as an individual or as a family unit versus what do we as social workers have to do to address the systemic discrimination by standing in the winds of that and addressing very powerful actors that perpetuate that discrimination. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we need to become, as Barbara said, actively involved in the solution. And I want to emphasize that these are not problems without solutions. In fact, what we have seen over the decades is that there are tons of different reports, academic writings, uh, First Nations uh, declarations that call for the same solution time and time again. And what social workers have not been effective at is actually being able to implement those solutions. And so it's vital that you look for what the solutions are and involve yourself, as Barb said, with whatever capacities and gifts you have in the implementation of those solutions. And if you want to get started, you can go onto our website, fncaringsociety.com, and find seven free ways to get going right now. And I guess the only thing I will add to that very eloquent explanation is that I think you have to start with inequity being the theory of the case. So too often we focus on the symptoms of inequity and not the root cause. And if you start with inequity being the theory of the case, it's what's driving poverty, it's what's driving a lot of the, you know, the individual symptoms, then to me, you begin to address the system and its contribution to why individual children and families struggle so much. And the responsibility then shifts, as Cindy says, from holding the individual accountable for structural inequalities to holding the system accountable.
governments don't create change, they respond to change. And uh, social workers uh, need to understand that meeting with government officials and presenting solutions, that's only one strategy. Uh, we need to become better at creating social movements, uh, really uh, leading the way in putting ourselves on the front lines of these uh, challenges towards systemic discrimination. Uh, ensuring that a advocacy course that teaches peaceful, respectful, and effective advocacy is core curriculum and required curriculum in every single uh, BSW program, mm -hmm. MSW program, and PhD program. Uh, because the reality is, although we, we trump ourselves as social justice advocates, I, I ask my group, the classes, when? Mm -hmm. When in the entire history of this country have we ever led a social justice movement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the answer is never. Um, it's always been uh, caring citizens or people of other professions who have been at the front lines of that. And it's time that social work uh, embraces that reality. And if it really wants to be about social justice, then we need to retune our way of thinking and acting and educating people so that they're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. I would just add, I mean, accept nothing less. I mean, accept nothing less. You have to hold people accountable for, um, um, for the way that we structure society. You have to hold people accountable. And for social workers, absolutely. The, the advocacy piece is, has to be front, has to be like, amplified in our program in a way that is uh, fundamental and we have to understand all of those mechanisms that go into being good advocates like the technical piece of advocacy you have to know history you have to know data <laughs> you you have to know how to write well you have to know how to present concepts clearly and cogently you can't be afraid to talk on a video camera because you're going to make a mistake or say the wrong word. You, you, the, like the technical piece of advocacy, sometimes I think we minimize how hard it is and how much, how much work you have to do, how much personal responsibility you have to take to those building blocks of advocacy. Yeah, I couldn't agree more than, uh, you know, with what Barb has said. It really is a skill set and it takes discipline. Um, and no one ever taught me how to be an advocate. I had to teach myself by having conversations with people, reading, uh, watching a lot of good exemplars who are out there in the community doing different social movements. Um, so there's no excuse for not learning about advocacy, even if you have to teach yourself. And there, thanks to the internet, there's all kinds of great resources out there. You can begin with the Moral Courage uh, website on YouTube and then build out from there. But we all have to accept our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we can't sit back and say, well, no one's taught me, so I'm not going to do it. Um, that can't be the default position. We have a higher responsibility than that. And even, you know, even if you're not comfortable public speaking or with one aspect of advocacy, then figure out what you're really good at, be the best at it, and ask someone where this skill set is helpful in terms of the larger social justice piece. When you're doing advocacy, you want to make sure you're doing right, not just being right. And um, I would say to folks who are in research and they identify as a qualitative or quantitative researcher that you're really asking the wrong question. <laughs> um, I will use whatever method is required to answer the proper question so that we can advance a cause in a public interest. So make sure that you pressure yourself um, to be able to be reasonably fluent in all the different research methodologies. Mm -hmm. And even if you yourself are not gonna be doing research, that you are able to appraise the evidence that's coming forward and hold yourself accountable to that standard of doing right versus being right. This cannot be about you. You have to uh, really keep your eye on the ball about the type of change that would seriously mm -hmm. redress the injustice that others are living at a daily basis. Mm -hmm.